Hello, welcome back. Um, I want to go back to chapter 20 just at the last part because I, I didn't get to really finish. My time is running out. Um, notice that, or remember first how I said something about the ducks and Holden's concern for what happens to them when the lake is frozen. And the question is revealing more of an inner question that he has about death. And um, I had mentioned that that was an important part, and he brings it up again after he runs out of that bar and he's kind of starting to cry, and it, it just seems like he's just getting very pathetic. And he goes back to Central Park and he looks for the ducks and says he nearly fell in the lake. He's looking for them. And then he mentions where Allie, his brother, is buried and how his parents would go visit the grave and they would put flowers on the grave. And, and he would go out there a few times, but he had a really hard time going um, to see him. It didn't seem natural for the world to be going on and then someone like Allie to, to not be a part of it anymore. And then he said a really horrible part was when it rained and he's watching all these other people who are visiting graves and they're running to their cars and probably getting ready to go to some swanky restaurant or something like that afterwards. And I, I think it's the, the continuity of, of that's going, people's lives continue and he doesn't understand how, you know, how does this continue? How does, how do we keep living? And that is kind of bringing us towards the end as well. So in chapter 21, he gets back into his house. His parents are conveniently gone. And he sneaks into uh, Phoebe's room, which she's staying in, DB's room. And this is, I think, kind of a nostalgic moment. I think he misses his older brother too, DB. I think it, from the way it sounds, it seems like um, the siblings were all really close to each other. Um, so she finally wakes up. He's been looking through her notebooks and just little cute stuff that she has. And he mentions uh, also how tidy she is and how she puts things where they belong. And this is important for Holden because I think he likes to see things reverent. I think my cat wants me to hold him for a second. So when she's sleeping, he says, you know, children look so cute and pretty and precious, their little mouths open. But if you contrast this with an older person and they're drooling and they don't look so well, it, it doesn't look good. And it's because children are further away from that mortality, which is why it just seems like a discord, like something is wrong that Allie is gone as a child, that his life was cut short. And he's having a very difficult time with that. So anyways, he talks to, uh, Phoebe wakes up, she's excited to see him. He says, oh, she's so affectionate, but he needs that. And that's what he really loves about her too. And she also listens to him. She she does what a kid does and just sort of jumps around and, and talks and gets excited. But when she she knows that her brother's in, in, in trouble and in pain, she really feels for him and she really tries to understand him. And, and that's this is the communication that's kind of been lost along the way. Uh, just, I'm just gonna just say, she brought up the, the Christmas pageant for Americans, which is kind of ironic. If you uh, listen to my lectures on the Great Gatsby, I introduce this concept of the American religion, which a lot of people don't think about. But Christianity in America has kind of its own uh, special belief system that I think ties in with American ideals. So people have kind of combined this because that's after the Protestant Reformation and, and churches were dividing and trying to figure out who they were, what they believed, it had a lot to do with democracy and what, how they wanted that reflected in this country. And we're so far removed from it now, we don't even really think about it. But I think a lot of 
the reasons why people view Christianity as they do, the, the way that they do in, in this country, has a lot to do with the influence of the Puritans. So maybe at some point I'll get into that, maybe with Scarlet Letter or something, I'm thinking about it. My next um, lecture, by the way, the next one I'm getting ready to uh, talk about is Jude the Obscure. And that is a challenging book, but it it's well worth your time, especially if you're pretty ambitious, uh, because there's not a whole lot on to the obscure. And um, I don't think a lot of teachers want to teach it. I love to teach it. So um, you can join me for that if you like these lectures. So what they call the conversation goes back to, of course, you know, you were supposed to be here Wednesday. Why are you here now? And she's figured it out. You got kicked out again. This is, this keeps happening. Daddy's going to kill you. And uh, he says, no, 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 come on. And she's really upset with him about it and accuses him of not liking anything, which is something that comes up later on when he talks to his teacher. Um, Antolini says kind of the same thing, but in the matter of, of education. Um, so, he tries to explain to her about, you know, there's mean guys at this school and it's, it's full of a bunch of phonies. And uh, one of the things that he mentioned when he was talking about DB and um, his involvement in World War II, he says, you know, just imagine having people uh, in the military that you're stuck with, like um, Ackley and uh, Stradlater and, and Maurice, a mean guy like Maurice. I mean, there's all these different types of people, and they're in this institution. Um, at the end of that, too, I didn't mention it, but he said, you know, if another war happened, an atomic bomb, I'm going to put myself right on it, and <laughs> I'll be the just write it and explode. So um, he, he kind of shows a little bit of sympathy for Alkley, too, because he talks about, you know, guys and their fraternities and... Um, frat boy behavior and how uh, they won't accept a guy just because he may be a little pimply and doesn't brush his teeth so uh, <laughs> you know they exclude these guys and that there's even in 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 a school like that there's still there's still a class system you know they're still deciding you know who belongs and who doesn't based on various traits that you may or may not have so uh, the conversation kind of goes on and, and he does talk about, you know, she asked him, why can't you just maybe be a lawyer or something like that? And, and the, the, the main um, theme of the whole book happens right here. And, and you know this a lot of times, like with To Kill a Mockingbird, it's the point where the title is revealed. So this is, I'm going to read this part, because this is where the title is revealed. And, and he's saying, I, I don't know exactly what I want to do. I know, and he's under pressure to start deciding this. And he just, he doesn't know. He doesn't know himself well enough. But this is what he does know. I thought it was, oh, the, well, let me preface this by saying that it comes from the song, um, or the poem, rather, um, if a body meet a body is the right words. But notice that that sounds... Um, almost kind of an underlining sexual thing, you know, meet a body in the rye field. He thinks of it as catch a body. It's not meat. Um, so just a little bit of a connotative difference there. Um, if a body catch a body, I said, anyway, I kept picturing all the little kids playing some game in this big field of rye and all. Thousands of little kids, and nobody's around, nobody big, I mean, except me. And I'm standing on the edge of some crazy cliff. What I have to do, I have to catch everybody if they start to go over the cliff. I mean, if they're running and they don't know where to look, uh, don't look where they're going, I'm sorry, and have to come out from somewhere and catch them. That's all I do all day. I just be the catcher in the rye and all. I know it's crazy, but that's the only thing I'd really like to be. I know it's crazy. So being the catcher in the rye is being able to catch kids 
before they start to conform and become one of those mean guys or mean girls at school. You know, because you, you have to get them probably before junior high age, I would think. And, you know, before they grow up and, and become, you know, a phony. Like he talked about, you know, how what a great guy Spencer was. But then when, you know, Mr. Thurman would sit in his class and try to cut up and make all these jokes and Spencer would be laughing like a madman. I know exactly what he's talking about. And it's, it's just not real. But also brings us back to James Castle, who commits suicide. And I'm going to suggest that James Castle is Holden's double. There's a difference between, there's a, difference between a double character and a, and a character foil. In a character foil, you see the two together. And one characteristic exemplifies the other. So in uh, Romeo and Juliet, you have Mercutio and Romeo. And where Mercutio is, you know, outgoing and hyper, um, Romeo is kind of heartsick, and he's he seems very mellow compared to the characteristics. But but since they're close, it's like a, a foil. You know, you you exemplify, and you may have this with your friends, where you might be really outgoing and your friend might be quiet. But somehow the combination, the contrast which is why this is a tool, a literary tool, by contrast, it's, um, it's exemplifying, bringing out your character just by the juxtaposition of the other person. And that's what, that's what character foil. But I'm going to say double because they don't really know each other. But he is wearing Holden's turtleneck that he lent him. So I, he just asked me to borrow it, and I'm surprised he could talk. So... But what, what does James do, though? He, he kind of gives you a little more insight in who James is. Um, he said something, and he wouldn't take it back. And these boys come in the room, and he says, I, can't, I won't even tell you what they did to him because it's so repulsive. Okay, so you can only imagine what, what, how cruel sometimes people can be, right? And... But no matter what they did to him, he wouldn't go back on what he said. He couldn't say something that was false. And he, in his way, could not be a phony. He had to be who he was. But his choice was to jump out of a window where Holton has to learn how to live. So that's, that's the juxtaposition there. That might be useful to you in some way, in some question. But I, I think a lot of people just miss that. And I, I think it's huge that this is the choice. This is where he wanted, because Holden's been suicidal this whole time. And I mean, even, but even when he was thinking about, um, I might get pneumonia and die. And oh my gosh, what is my mother? She's, she's never even gotten over Allie's death, which she never will. You never get over a child's death. And then Phoebe, you know, so he, he's learning, you know, you have to live for other people. And I think it's symbolic when he gives his red hat to Phoebe. I think that might be a way of kind of coming to terms with having to grow up because part of it, part of the recompense of it is learning to care about someone more than yourself. To where, you know, you might be miserable in your own head but there might be someone else or something else you believe in that makes it worthwhile. And that's what he's, he comes to terms with, I think, in, in Phoebe's room. So he leaves um, Phoebe and, uh, room, okay, so there's something very ambiguous happens when he goes to uh, Antolini's house. But before he leaves um, Phoebe, he does break down and cry and I think, you know, and it's right before uh, he asked for a couple of bucks, can I borrow some money? And she's been saving up Christmas money and buying gifts for people. And he's, she's willing to give all of it to Holden. And this makes him cry because, you know, this whole time he really is thinking about how everyone is just interested in, in themselves and selfish. And, and there is a lot of, of bad things, bad people in this world, but there's also good. And... Phoebe is proof of that 
that she's she's a good person and um, in, you know in return then he gives her the hat so I think probably the most ambiguous part of the whole um, book is what happens with his teacher now remember this is the same guy that um, Holden said Antolini was Mr. Antolini was the one that picked up James Castle everyone was stayed away from him I mean he's got blood and everything and he looks terrible and um, this teacher picks him up and carries him away he's that's a heroic moment I think and he's also um, has just had lunch with Holden's dad so you can tell he's a friend of the family and I think that Salinger is letting you know that he's going to a safe place um, that this this is a good guy I mean especially since he's an English teacher <laughs> the English teachers in the book are, are usually you know the good people and yet at the end it, there's a very awkward moment but before I get to that let's just see what, what did they talk about he doesn't he understands Holden he he even says you know there's sometimes people take a really long time to figure out what it is they want to do and he reminds him of, of people who have have been through this before you can find this in poetry you certainly see it in romanticism you know Wordsworth is uh, who also put emphasis on the child and the imagination and poets worried about their profession because they were just a poet too and there you know there's examples though he says and this is I'm thinking right now of Longfellow's A Psalm of Life which is kind of a reaction to Shakespeare's Tomorrow and Tomorrow Creeps in This Petty Pace you know that poem that soliloquy that Macbeth does he says tell me not in mournful numbers life is just a waking dream life is real life is earnest and the grave is not its goal and, and his, his thesis on this, his claim, is that great men can make their lives sublime. And even though they die, what it does is it leaves footprints behind so that some other shipwrecked brother can come along and seeing takes faith again and is able to go on. Because of, and it's kind of like Joseph Campbell's idea of the heroic journey. So you have no reason to fear all the heroes have gone before you they've laid their path out all you have to do is find the thread of the path and keep going more or less it's basically what he's I think the point he's trying to get at and um, so the reason why I have such a hard time is because Salinger does not make this man seem the least bit creepy but he is a little bit drunk and he does make this remark you know good night handsome now he's also married and he seems to have a great relationship and be affectionate with his wife uh, so once Holden is you know sleeping on the couch he um, starts kind of petting his hair and, you know stroking his head or something like that which I'll admit that's not something that two guys would normally um, do but think back to what he, why he meets up with this guy Laos and the story that he has to say about that and how that guy just scared the heck out of them by his notions of homosexuality and that you know it it's just a matter of time it may come out of you too and Holden is scared of this he mentions himself as being too yellow, cowardly. And I think that that's a fear, a phobia even, homophobic, it, wondering as I grow up, is this going to suddenly happen to me? Because I have, because I'm sensitive and I have deep feelings and, and things like that. And so when he says, you know, when he's leaving there, he says, you know, he's shaking, he's sweating, and um, Antolini's response is, you're a strange boy. 
and I, I want you to come back here and go to sleep. And he says, I'm going to go to bed, you know. And I, I, I read, you know, articles where people assume that this man make, made an advance on him just because that's what Holden says. But you have to read beyond what Holden says because he contradicts himself all the time. What has he been saying all along about homosexuality? And then he has this connection. And I, I tend to think, maybe this is just my own projection because I don't want to believe it, but I tend to think it's, it's a nurturing thing that he does because he, he really does feel bad for Holden's situation. And he takes it as this, this sort of thing happens to me all the time. So, you know, maybe something did happen to Holden. Uh, you know, when he says, I don't even want to tell you what they did to this one guy, it's repulsive. Who knows, maybe something like that has happened also to Holden. So, um, it, he leaves it ambiguous though. You know, he leaves it kind of for the reader to decide. But, yeah, I don't think, I, I think the strongest evidence is that I don't think that he would go to the trouble of saying how sweet this man was um, with the boy who committed suicide to, to later say that he was going to then molest Holden because he's just touching his hair, which is a, a pretty nurturing thing to do. You know, he doesn't do anything else to him. Okay, so I'm going to stop there, and I think probably I have one more, uh, but I never know, so we'll see. All right, thanks. Bye.